Okay, now that we're in the chapter 8.3 subsection of the business cycle chapter, let's pick up with the model of aggregate supply and demand and continue running with it. Now, we've already gone through aggregate demand in the previous set of lectures, so now let's talk about aggregate supply. From its name, this should be pretty easy to understand. Aggregate supply is the total quantity of output or real GDP that producers are willing and able to supply at different price levels that are possible in a given period of time. So this is taking a look at not at the, at the output of any particular producer, but all producers for the entire economy at any one time. So it's the collective behavior. It, it comprises all goods and services. And Luckily, because it's going to be something that we have already seen before, the aggregate supply curve slopes upward just like a normal supply curve does because suppliers are willing to bring more goods and services to market at higher price levels and, of course, are willing to produce lower amounts of output at lower price levels. So why does the aggregate supply curve slope upward? There's two main major effects, the profit effect and the cost effect. Let's take each one separately. The profit effect states that if there's no change in the cost of operating a business, meaning for some reason costs aren't changing, but the price level in total has risen, that means that businesses can charge higher prices, but no increase in their cost, profits will rise. If profits rise, would a business person like to be doing more of that or less of it? I think it's pretty self-explanatory. You know, self business people want to produce more if it's more profitable. So. If price levels are rising, but costs are not, then businesses want to increase output. The cost effect. This says, what if costs are increasing, making products more expensive? Then, looking at it from a slightly different angle, if you are a business person, you would only be willing to produce more goods and services if you could charge a higher price. So either way, what will be true about higher prices and the desire of business people to produce? Business people want to produce more at higher prices than they want to do at lower prices. We know that's true for individual businesses in a micro market, and it's also true for all businesses as a group in the macro market. Now let's take a look at some actual graphs and see how we're going to um, put them together. In the left-hand graph, we have aggregate demand, and you can see it slopes downward. It looks just like any normal demand curve. But remember, with aggregate demand, we're not talking about any specific business. We're talking about the desire for to purchase goods and services that all businesses are producing. And then in the right hand graph, we're looking at aggregate supply. This is the desire of all businesses to produce based on what the price level is doing. And we've already gone through the different reasons why this is true. Um, let's go ahead and just um, mention just a, a quick in this box right up here for the uh, demand. There's a couple of reasons that we haven't talked about before, but let's go ahead and, and highlight them real quickly. The aggregate demand curve slopes downward because of some, something called the real balance effect. I explained that without putting a label on it uh, in the previous set of slides 8.2. The real balance effect says that whatever balance you have in your checking account and your savings account, if prices on average are falling, since you still have the same amount of money in your account, you are now a wealthier person because the same amount of money now buys more when prices are falling. So you would expect that, just as you would th think, that if prices fall, the desire to buy more goes up. So that's what the downward sloping curve says. Let's take a look at this one right here. With the, whatever money you have in your savings account, if prices were this level, you and everyone else would want to buy this much stuff because that's all the money you have. But if prices fall, even with the same amount of money, what happens to your purchasing power? Well, the purchasing power goes up, which means now instead of buying only this amount of stuff, you now want to buy this amount of stuff. So why did that happen? Because at this amount of stuff, look how low where the prices are. The lower prices gave you more purchasing power from the same amount of money, so you wanted to buy more. The foreign trade effect refers to the fact that if American prices are falling, what happens to foreigners' desire to buy American goods? I think it just should recognize that would go up. And vice versa. What if American inflation is really running strong and American prices keep rising and you're a foreigner? What happens to your desire to buy American products? They would go down. 
So again, you would have the aggregate demand curve sloped exactly like we see it here on this, on this um, slide. And of course, the interest rate effect would be the very last one. Remember what we talked about in um, previous lectures, we recognize that the real interest rate, rather the nominal interest rate has to rise due to inflation. In order for someone who's a lender to earn a real rate of return, you have to have what the nominal rate minus the inflation rate gives you what you're really gonna get to keep in actual spending power. So if prices are rising, what will happen to interest rates? They will rise. As interest rates rise, what happens to your desire to go out and buy a new house or a new car? It will go down. So that's exactly what we see here with the aggregate demand curve. As prices rise, they trigger an increase in interest rates. The increase in interest rates slow down the desire to purchase things and vice versa. If interest rates are falling, then obviously people want to borrow more money in order to go buy more stuff. So a lower price level will let interest rates come down and therefore people would want to buy more on credit. So all of those um, subsections of the um, demand, uh, aggregate demand curve explain why it slopes downward. And then of course, with the aggregate supply curve over here, we have the two points we just talked about, the profit effect and the cost effect, which we just did in the previous slide. Now, where are we heading with all this? What we're trying to do is get to where we put the two curves together, just like we did with supply and demand. And that's exactly what it looks like. You notice we have an aggregate demand curve sloping downward, an aggregate supply curve sloping upward. The two of them are exactly equal at point E, which we call equilibrium. And that gives us the quantity of goods and services produced in equilibrium at a particular price level for the entire economy. So it turns out that we can think about equilibrium for the entire economy the same way we think about equilibrium for individual markets. So where aggregate demand and aggregate supply intersect, we have our equilibrium. So I won't beat that any further because I think it's pretty obvious. Now, here's where a problem exists. This is something that's new. The idea that an equilibrium can take place at an undesirable location. In this particular graph, let's take a look at these x-axis. Here we have QE, which is the quantity that we have come to at equilibrium. And here we have something called QF. QF is defined as the quantity of output at full employment. The idea here is if we have everybody who wants to find a job working, the unemployment rate is down now down to what we call its natural rate, which we covered in the previous chapters on unemployment. At the natural rate of unemployment, we will be producing a certain amount of goods and services because all workers are working. This is the amount right here, Q sub F. We're assuming now for this particular graph that the full employment level of output would be way out here. But you notice where we are, we're way back here. So in this case, the equilibrium is taking place at less than full employment, which means for some reason, our economy is stuck at point QE when it really needs to be up at point QF. But remember the meaning of equilibrium. Equilibrium says for some reason we're at a balance point where supply and demand are equal to each other. It just turns out to be that that does not take place at the full employment level. So in this particular example, a Keynesian would make the argument that this economy will not naturally rebalance at the QF level. It will stay at the QE level, which means unemployment is higher than it should be. And therefore, the government should do something about it. Now, classical economists would make a different argument. They would say, no, one of these curves will shift enough to move the economy to QF. And again, this is where we have these constant debates among economists as to how much the government should intervene in the economy. But right now, we're making the Keynesian argument to understand why we would be in a position where the economy was not at full employment at any particular time. In other words, why are we in a recession? So the equilibrium level is too low for the level of full employment. So let's talk about shifting aggregate um, supply and demand curves. Let's assume that, uh, let's see, um, let's shift left for first. In this example, we can see on the dotted line, let's assume the economy actually was at the full employment level. You notice if this was the truth about aggregate supply, 
And if this was the aggregate demand, then point F would be the equilibrium and point F lines up very nicely with full employment, right? So that would be an economy where we want it to be. But what could make the aggregate supply curve shift to the left? That's not what we want to happen, but what could make it happen? Well, let's take a look at several reasons we have here on our list. So the aggregate supply curve could shift from AS0 to AS1 if business costs rise for some reason. If business taxes rise, that's no different than a cost rise as far as a business is concerned. Or let's say a natural disaster occurs. Let's assume that oh, we'll use like um, Katrina, the hurricane hits New Orleans and let's assume it knocks out a bunch of oil production platforms and they cannot pump oil for three months until they get repaired. During that three months, there will be a shortage of oil. A shortage of oil will reduce the ability of the economy to produce. Fewer truckers will be able to deliver goods and services. You know, fewer factories will be able to run you know, second and third shifts. All of these reasons will cause the economy to slow down compared to where it would have been if the, economy, if the hurricane had never knocked out the oil platforms. So the point I want you all to realize is, is that while this is a particular aggregate supply curve balancing against this aggregate demand curve, it's not guaranteed by you know, nature to always stay there. It could shift over to this one. And I just gave you the example of a hurricane causing that. So the hurricane would essentially push the economy below its full employment level by pushing it over here to Q1. And so therefore the economy is now out of balance, okay? Now, of course, it doesn't have to always shift to the left. What if this was the aggregate supply curve and we were underproducing compared to where we need to be to be at full employment? What could get this curve to push out to this curve where we want it to be? Well, then the list simply goes in the opposite direction. If business costs can be brought down, if taxes can be brought down, if instead of a natural disaster causing a bad thing, what if we had a naturally good thing, uh, a bounteous harvest, what they're referring to here, what if the weather was perfect this year and so growing conditions were as good as they've been in 10 years? So we have more corn, more soybeans, more, soybeans, more um, wheat than we normally have. Then what would be true? Well, then the U.S. would be wealthier and we'd be able to produce at a much higher level and therefore all these workers would now be employed and we would be producing at the QF or the full employment level of output. So the aggregate supply curve can either move leftward or move rightward depending on certain conditions. But of course, the aggregate dem now we're going to talk about the aggregate demand curve. It can also shift because we can have, um, let's see, shifting left or shifting right. Let's go ahead and assume um, that the dotted line is the uh, current aggregate demand curve. So that would intersect the aggregate supply curve at point F, meaning we're starting at full employment. Let's assume that. Now, what could cause this curve to all of a sudden move to the left, causing the demand to be too low to maintain full employment? Well, let's go and look at our list. S spending decrease. Uh, let's assume that um, Americans, because they're worried about the war in Ukraine spreading, start becoming more conservative in their spending and they refuse to buy a new car. They say, let's put it off till next year. Let's not buy a new car this year because we're worried about the economy in the future. You notice what that actually does. If people put off buying a new car, then what happens to the auto industry? Well, they cut back, right? They can't just keep producing cars if no one's buying them. So if spending decreases, then the auto industry will cut back on production. They will lay off workers. And then what will happen to the employment level? Well, obviously we'll no longer be at full employment. We'll be at Q2, we'll be at less than full employment. And that would show up here because we have now a new demand curve, aggregate demand curve intersecting the aggregate supply curve over here at point H. Now, of course, I could give you other examples in this list, but you can figure them out pretty quickly yourself. Also, make sure you read the textbook. Expectations the future get worse. Um, taxes increase and people have less money to spend. Any of those things could cause the aggregate demand curve to shift left. Now, what if we were at this one to begin with, in which case we are under the level of full employment? What could get this demand curve to shift over to the dotted one instead? That would be shifting to the right. Well, anything that causes spending to increase, 
anything that causes the expectations of consumers to improve about the future, or if taxes are decreased, every one of those things will get people to spend more money than they were before, and that will get firms that are selling all these extra goods that people are buying to hire new workers until eventually they hire so many workers, we are now at full employment level of output. So the aggregate demand curve can shift either left or right, just like the aggregate supply curve can shift left or right. And so therefore we have our final slide. We can cause the economy to go into recession. We could start at a point of full employment and either the aggregate supply curve or the aggregate demand curve shifts to the left, in which case the entire economy's equilibrium moves below full employment. That would cause a recession. Or the aggregate supply curve or the aggregate demand curve could shift to the right, which would cause the economy to recover from a recession and therefore increase the total amount of business taking place. So the point of this of this subsection of our lecture is merely to illustrate that an economy can be at equilibrium at some particular point and then move away from that equilibrium and actually be below the full employment level of output causing high unemployment for some reason of either the aggregate demand curve shifting or the aggregate supply curve shifting. And there were multiple reasons that we gave within our bullet points for why either the aggregate demand curve or the aggregate supply curve could shift to the left. And then we start thinking about what could cause it to shift back up to the right. And that's where the Keynesians will step in and try to get the government to shift that aggregate demand or that aggregate supply curve farther to the right.